So uh, thank you all so much for being here. How wonderful to have such a large crowd. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. And I want to give a special thanks to uh, Deacon Eric Wilkinson. And uh, Eric is one of my favorite people ever. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you all that here. He's always smiling. And something about being around him just makes me feel calm and that everything's going to be OK. And that is a great quality to have in this difficult line of work. So thank you, Eric. And for we, he and I have been on and off the GFADP board for many years together, and we've worked together. And it's just always such a pleasure uh, to work with you. And I thank you for all you've done to make this possible, and for the staff here. Um, we're just really honored to be here. So um, as Kathy said, my name is Mary Catherine Johnson. I'm the executive director of a Christian ministry called New Hope House. We're located in uh, just 10 miles from Georgia's death row, and intentionally so. And you'll, you'll hear why in a minute when I talk about uh, what we do. And um, as part of the journey of hope, I'm really here representing the people on death row, the 37 men in Jackson, and there's one woman on death row. She's housed at um, Lee Arendelle State Prison in Alto, Georgia. And um, I'm representing them and their families uh, because that's what my ministry serves. Um, and also uh, people who are facing capital punishment here in Georgia through uh, who haven't been sentenced yet and their families. So I'm really here speaking for them and telling their stories and my interactions with them. So that's how I connect in with the journey. Um, is not necessarily through uh, being directly impacted by capital punishment, but through serving those who have been directly impacted by it in our state. So I'm excited to be here for lots of reasons. Um, and it's nice to be among people of the Catholic faith. Um, with a name like Mary Catherine, I know you probably guessed that I was raised Catholic. <laughs> I grew up in uh, Macon, Georgia, and went to 12 years of Catholic school. So being Catholic and uh, going to Catholic school was, it was really a, a, an important part of my formation, my views on the death penalty, and, and my views on serving others. So that, you know, looking back, um, was an incredibly um, important time in my life. Um, I was on the debate team in high school, and we actually debated the death penalty. Um, and it was really interesting, the nuns and the people that were, you know, our teachers there were really encouraging us to learn about both sides uh, so that we could make our own decisions about it. And it was just something in my heart that I knew was wrong and that I wanted to oppose at a very early age. And it was wonderful to be a part of a very supportive environment uh, in Catholic school to, to nurture that and to encourage me to look into it further and to what I could do about it. So um, there are uh, three Catholics that I wanted to bring up that have been incredibly influential on my life. And wh what I wanted to do is just tell you a little bit about my story and how I got to do this work and then share some of the stories of the men on death row that I visit and, and their families. Um, so the three Catholics I want, and I, I think you probably um, know, know them all. The first one is uh, Sister Helen Prejean, you know, who wrote Dead Man Walking. And, you know, early on in my, when I was in my young adult life, I heard her speak. And, you know, um, Eric mentioned that this is a very difficult topic. And, you know, it is, admittedly, there's a lot of sorrow and trauma associated with it. But there's also, in my ministry, and this is how, what keeps me going, an incredible amount of joy and, and, and witnessing of God's grace in action. And I saw that in Sister Helen when she talked, if you've ever heard her talk. And if you haven't, I highly recommend it. She just had so much joy. She joked. She laughed. You know, and this is a woman who had been, you know, in a very dark places in Louisiana, you know, witnessing people being electrocuted. She was still able to have this incredible joy. And I always admired that about her and thought, I want to be like her. So she's always been a huge influence. Another person, another Catholic that has influenced me deeply uh, is Father Gregory Boyle, who wrote Tattoos on the Heart. Uh, he is, uh, has Homeboy Industries out in California. Again, if you've never heard him speak, I highly recommend it. Um, reading his book, Tattoos on the Heart, and the subtitle of that is The Power of Boundless Compassion. 
And he really showed me in that book what it meant to have boundless compassion. And I thought, I, that's what I want to do for people who are impacted by the death penalty. And then the third is um, uh, Dorothy Day. Um, and I um, was part of a community here in Atlanta uh, called the Open Door Community. Some of you may have known it. I lived there and was really um, formed there by the teachings of Murphy Davis and Ed Loring, who founded it. And it was a Catholic worker community, uh, which is based on the teachings of uh, uh, Dorothy Day. So those are just some people that uh, figured y'all knew and that has really have really informed who I am and led me to where I am today. So um, the the facts that Kathy listed about the death penalty, um, the fact that it doesn't deter crime, that it's, you know, it, that it. Um, you know, that there's a high probability of executing innocent people, um, that, that most of the people who are sentenced to death have some form of intellectual disability or mental illness, traumatic childhood. All those facts early on informed, you know, were things that horrified me and, or, and gave me pause about why I should oppose this practice. And so in my early, when I was initially working against the death penalty, I was doing, I was living in Washington, D.C., um, I was working with the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, and back then it was way before cell phones and uh, email, and the way volunteers were put to work was we stuffed a lot of envelopes. We would get together and stuff envelopes, and it would be about the, and I would learn about the cases and things that the National Coalition were, was doing to abolish the death penalty. Um, so living in D.C. during my young adult life, that's, that was pretty much my exposure to it. Uh, and that's when I heard Sister Helen speak and was really inspired. But then in 2007, um, I moved back to Georgia, my home state, and I was working at Emory University in the art department there. And I was driving to work one day and I was listening to NPR and uh, the, they announced on the radio that there was an execution that night. And I about drove off the road because Really, up to that point, I hadn't really thought about someone, you know, in my home state actually being executed. It, they'd all felt at arm's length to me, you know. And I was very fortunate to have a supervisor, uh, uh, my boss at Emory, was, uh, had kind of grown up in a tradition of protesting. And when I told him about the execution, he said, why don't we drive down to Jackson tonight and protest it? And that had never occurred to me to do that. And thank goodness he wanted to do it, and we drove, and it was, it was really kind of scary because when there's an execution, there's lots, there's police, you know, and all the guards, and they're in riot gear, and I'm not quite sure what they're expecting to happen because it's all these little, you know, nonviolent protesters showing up, and they're acting like we're bringing bombs to the place, and they search the cars and all this, and um, so it was very intimidating. So it was nice to have someone with me. And, but once I got there, there was this incredible group of people, maybe 20 people, who were there to say no to the execution. And up until that moment when I met these people, I only knew what the man being executed had done. I knew what his crime was, because that's what I heard on the radio. I knew that he had murdered someone, and I, that's all I knew about him, his name and his crime. But that night at the vigil, I heard about him in the fullness of his humanity. I heard people who knew him, who had visited him, who knew that he liked to play basketball, who knew about his faith journey, you know, while he was in prison, who knew um, about, you know, what Brian Stevenson says, is that he was so much more than the worst thing he's ever done. And I just remember crying that night, just thinking, you know, wow, this is, I'm really hearing about this person and just how disturbing it was just right down the road that they were going to strap him to a gurney and pump enough poison into him to kill him. And that is what happened that night. But I was changed forever by hearing all these people. And I thought, this is, these are my people. I, I knew I found my people that night. Because I like, and so I started getting involved with GFADP and with other groups. Because um, I really wanted to get closer to the issue. I wanted to know the people involved, who was being impacted by it. And um, shortly after that, I started, I became a pen pal for someone on death row. Because I thought that would be a really good way to get to know 
what their experience was like. And his name was Marcus Wellens. Uh, I wrote to him and visited him for six years uh, before he received an execution warrant. Um, that time with Marcus, I'm just so grateful for. I mean, it was my first time interacting with anyone in prison um, and on death row. He taught me so much. Um, I learned a lot about boundaries. You know, I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning because uh, I was so new at it. But he, you know, helped me through it. He had been on death row but at that point about 20 years, so he'd had a lot of pen pals. And, you know, we had developed an extraordinary friendship. And um, one day in 2014, I was uh, uh, at my desk. At, the, that, at that point, I was at the Open Door community. And his lawyer called and said, they came and got Marcus this morning and took him to death watch. And in Georgia, that's what we call kind of the two-week period before the execution is referred to as death watch. And the reason we call it that is because um, the prisoner is taken, the warden comes to their cell, he reads the, the execution warrant, says, Marcus Wellens, on this day and time, um, you will be put to death, and then it ends with, may God have mercy on your soul. And they, then they take him away, and he's watched 24-7, which is a kind of strange irony. They watch him so he doesn't commit suicide. Um, and um, they write down everything he does. And that two-week period was one of the most difficult of my life, um, you know, just trying to figure out how to support him and his family. Um, and, you know, we talked on the phone some. And um, the last two days of Death Watch um, are the families are allowed to visit all day. So if the execution's on a Tuesday night, the families can visit all day Monday and all day Tuesday. And um, so um, that Monday, I was there with his family, and we were visiting, and they only allow a few people at a time in with Marcus. So we were all taking turns, spending time with them. Uh, it was exhausting. Um, and there was just, it was just a roller coaster of, you know, we tried to laugh and talk, but then there would be times of really deep sorrow and tears. And, um, you know, and we would just take turns, you know, being with him. So then we leave the prison. The prison, you can imagine, very harsh place. Um, and the whole family was going to this place called New Hope House. So I went with them. And I knew about New Hope House, of course. It was about 10 minutes from the prison, but I'd never been there before. And we walk in, and this older couple who were the staff there, Ed and Laura Weir, were there. And they're like these little grandparents, so cute, you know. And they're standing there at the door. The house smells like lasagna and garlic bread. And I can't describe to you what it was like to go from that prison, the horror of the prison, to that loving environment. And we were all, I mean, to be welcomed with, you know, with such love, with good food, and just a place to be together. And I was there with Marcus's family that night. Then the next day, we all went back to the prison again, spent his last day with him. Uh, again, a very difficult day. Um, and when, I'll, I'll never forget when the guards told us, you know, time was up and we had to leave. Um, his mother let out some wails that I've, I've never heard in my life, the, just that kind of guttural sorrow of what it sounds like when you're, you know your son is about to be executed in a few hours. And it was just the, the sounds of her cries were just bouncing off the prison walls, and I'll never forget that. And we had to practically carry her out of there um, because what it was like for her to have to leave her son. And again, from there, we go to New Hope House, and there are Ed and Laura again. This time they made fried chicken. And it was just like the most loving environment, a place away. It was in the woods. It was away from everything. It was just like this place we could all be together. And that night when, you know, executions often go late into the night because of appeal, last-minute appeals, and he didn't actually die until close to midnight. So we just, you know, sat around and held hands, and it was just an incredible place to be. So you can imagine the impact that had on me being there. Um, and I remember waking up the next morning and saying, you know, I'm done. I don't ever want to have a two weeks like I just had. 
Uh, and I told Murphy Davis, one of the founders of the Open Door, and I told, she was there with us, and I told her, I said, I'm done, I, ca I can't do this again. And Murphy had been through many executions, and she said, I know your heart, you'll be back. And just give it time, take some time off. And of course, Murphy was right. And because of people like her and others that surrounded me with a lot of love, I was able to, you know, move into, um, doing what I do now. And a few years later, I heard they were looking. Uh, Ed and Laura had gotten to a place where they had gotten really too old to, to run the ministry, and they really need someone to come in and take over. And I resisted at first, because it was on a dirt road in Barnesville, Georgia, and I was like, I'm not, I'm not living on that dirt road. And, but I knew God was calling me to be there. And um, eventually I had to say yes. So I came in 2016 and uh, have been there ever since. And it's just been a remarkable journey. Um, so I want to just tell you a little bit about the ministry and what we do. Um, New Hope House was founded in 1988, over 35 years ago. And it was in response to the fact that in 1976, the Supreme Court had reinstated the death penalty in this country. And so up till 76, you know, we didn't have, between 72 and 76, we didn't have people on death row. But after it was reinstated, prosecutors started seeking it again, and death row was growing very, very quickly in Georgia. And there were communities like the Open Door Community, uh, Koinonia Farm, you may know them, down in South Georgia, uh, Jubilee Partners that were visiting on death row and were starting to hear what the needs were. And one of the things they determined was we really need a house of hospitality. Um, you probably heard the saying, there are no rich people on death row. Um, the, most of the families, you know, have very limited resources. Most of them can't, you know, can barely afford the gas to get there or might not have a reliable car. And they certainly can't afford hotel rooms and, you know, all the costs associated with spending a weekend in a place that you don't live. Um, so they raised the money to build a house and um, near the prison, and the idea was that the families could come there, they could stay for free, uh, meals would be provided for them, and also, um, very important, was support, you know, up for their questions. Navigating the prison system is very difficult. The rules are always changing. What can they wear? What can they bring into the prison? Um, what do I do if my son's being mistreated? You know, what do I do if he's not getting the health care he needs? So the staff was trained and knew how to answer those questions and guide them. And that was incredibly valuable to the families, as you can imagine. And then one day, uh, a mother uh, of a death row prisoner asked one of the staff people at New Hope House to accompany her to a hearing. And um, so the, person, the staff person did, and after the hearing was over, the mother said, you don't know what it was like to have someone sitting with me who didn't want my son to die. And so a light bulb went off, like we really need to be going to all the trials and hearings because the families need support there too, not only at the trial level, when the, when, you know, before they're sentenced to death, but also, you know, there's probably 20 years of appeals ahead of them, many hearings and things, and the families, a lot of them are here in Atlanta, you know, they're scared to drive to Atlanta because of the traffic and the parking. So, you know, just helping them navigate all of that. And that's a big part of what I do now, um, is I go to all the capital trials, I take families to the hearings, I sit with them, I try to explain what's going on. It's not like, we were, someone, we were talking about law and order earlier, it's not like law and order is all exciting all the time. It's like hours of sitting with a little bit of excitement and then more hours of sitting. And, you know, I try to explain to them what's going on and because the lawyers are focused on what they're doing and we're also there to support them, but I'm really there to support the families. Um, and then um, one of the things I love to share is that Sister Helen said in one of her talks that I think of every time I go into a courtroom is she described, she was standing in a church like this when I heard her say it, that the courtroom was looked like this too. You know, there, there's an aisle down the middle and then both sides, and that she imagines the cross of Jesus lying down the middle with his arms outstretched to both sides of the courtroom. 
and we all meet in the heart of Jesus. And I, I think of that image every time I go into a courtroom because it's so true. I am there. I believe God has called me to sit with the defendant and the defendant's family, and that's where, who I'm there to support. But I'm not against the other side by any stretch. My heart goes out to them, to the victims. I think about them. I pray for them. Um, and I, so I love that image that Jesus is equally reaching to both sides and that we meet in the heart. And, you know, sometimes the heart of Jesus is in the bathroom of the courthouse and I'll encounter, you know, one of the, the family members, uh, the victim's family members. And some of them are curious about why I'm there and they'll ask me, who are you? Why are you sitting on that side? And I'll tell them, and I said, but I'm here for you too. And at the last trial I attended, I said, and I pray for you every day, and my heart breaks for you, and I hope you can find some solace. And she, she burst into tears and hugged me. So there can be some moments like that. Um, it's not that we're, you know, it, it, it does feel very separated most of the time, but there can be some moments like that. So um, one of my favorite parts of what I do is I visit a lot of the men on death row. So I have a lot of friendships like I have with, not as deep as I have with Marcus, because when I was visiting Marcus, it was just him. And, you know, I only focus on him. But now I visit, you know, anywhere between seven and 10 men every month. And, you know, and they're all very different. Um, so I get, the way I approach it is I, I, I meet them where they are. And some of them just want to talk and I'm there to listen. Some of them want to talk about faith-related things. Some of them want to pray. Some of them want to talk about movies and books, and like they'll tell me something to watch, and I'll watch it, and then we'll discuss it. And I've watched some crazy movies because of that, you know, and um, <laughs> some stuff, you know, and uh, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, why did you tell me to watch that movie? But it's, you know, it's just something to discuss with them. And, and sometimes we read books together with one of the men. Uh, we read a book that kind of examined all the religions of the world because um, he was just curious about, um, you know, things other than Christianity. So I've read some amazing books with them and, and discussed them. And um, like I said, some of them want to just talk about their faith. Um, but I'm not there to force any kind of accountability. I'm not there to save anyone. Uh, I am not there to, if, you know, force anything. So I'll let things come up naturally. And some of the men eventually do want to talk about their crimes with me. Mark, it took Marcus several years because that was the worst day of his life. And he had a lot of shame uh, around it. And, you know, I'm his friend. He wants me to think well of him. And finally, one day he told me the whole story, but it took him years to get there. And I remember someone came to visit him once from the clergy and they immediately asked about his crime. And as the clergy person was leaving, Marcus said, I'm gonna give you a D minus on your visit. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was like, why? And he's like, because you asked me about my crime. He's like, I don't know you, and you know, I don't, don't, I don't, I'm not ready to talk to you about that. So that person later shared, like, he taught me a lot in that moment <laughs> about what we're there to do and what we're there to support them as. So, um, like I said, having my, the friendships on the row have just been, um, you know, some of the saving grace of my ministry. Um, and I also have the, the privilege of seeing people on the row through the eyes of their family members, um, because the families who come to New Hope House, uh, I've, I've tried really hard to make the ministry a welcoming, the guest house a welcoming place. I'd love for y'all to come down and see it sometime. Church groups come all the time. Sometimes we have work days where we do projects around the house. Um, and I, I love, I try to make it, like everything soft. The blankets are soft. You know, everything is, is very welcoming, I hope. And one thing I do is put up a welcome sign with the, the um, welcoming whatever family's coming, and I always put a picture of their loved one and say, you know, many blessings on your visits with, you know, whoever they're visiting. And inevitably, when the families come in and see that, they start crying. And then I cry with them. And it's because they're so used to, you know, the shame of the, and being ostracized, many of them have been, some of them have even been ostracized from their own faith communities. And, you know, to come into an environment so loving and accepting is really, you know, overwhelming emotionally for them. 
So that's always a, a nice moment when they come in and see the welcome that we have for them. And, um, you know, the families and Marcus have just, um, especially Marcus and the other men, have ta just taught me so much. One story I like to share about um, Marcus, um, you know, I kind of had this attitude when I started going that I was the one bringing God to them, <laughs> to Marcus and to the prison, and I was the one with all the resources, you know, and, and so to help this poor person. And, you know, I quickly learned that's not the case at all, that they all have so much to teach me. It's, I hope it's mutual. It's really more the other way. And, you know, one story I tell about Marcus is he, um, for my birthday one year, he had his mother buy me a very expensive ring. And when I got it, I was horrified. And they, are, they were very poor family from Cordell, Georgia. They used to pick watermelons for a penny a watermelon, very poor family. And I was horrified that they would spend their limited resources on something for me. And unfortunately, I expressed that to Marcus. I mean, I was trying to be great. I said, that, thank you, but I really wish y'all hadn't done that. And he said, Mary Catherine, let us love you. We love you. Let us love you the way we want to love you. And that taught me so much. I'm like, of course, I'm going to be gracious from now on about whatever gifts are given to me in any form. And, and he taught me many things, and the, and the men on the road continually do. Um, and one of the things that I, um, you know, uh, share with the families is to constantly be looking for God in the prison. Because God, you know, and, and another thing Marcus taught me too, uh, I came one day to visit him and I said, well, what did you do this morning? And he said, well, I was talking to Jesus on my bunk this morning. And, and I kind of caught me off guard and I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, I talk to Jesus every morning. Jesus comes to my cell and talks to me. And, I, and, and then he explained, you know, what his version of Jesus was and what they talk about. And so, of course, Jesus is already there. I'm not bringing Jesus to the prison. Jesus is already there. God is already there. And so what I've learned and tell the families now, look, be on the lookout for God, moments of grace. I tell them that one for death watch. Um, I remember when my friend Scotty, his family was, about, was there and Scotty was on death watch. And his sister was trying to put her watch on that morning, the, the day Scotty was executed. And she couldn't, she was shaking so bad that she couldn't strap her watch. And I said to her, why don't you not wear your watch today? Let's not watch the clock, even though it's so tempting to watch it. I said, let's just be present. Let's just be, let's just soak up as much of Scotty as we possibly can. You know, soak up his how he feels when we hug him, what his laugh sounds like, you know, what it sounds like when he cries. Let's just try to remember every little thing about him. And let's be on the lookout for moments of grace because they're all over the prison if we're looking. And so that's what I try to tell the families. It's difficult. Believe me, when I was there with Marcus, it was difficult. But it is there if you're really looking. And... Um, <clears throat> So I, I have so many stories that I could tell you, and I, I don't want to over, overdo my time here. Um, and I'll just tell you one more story uh, about a death row mother. Um, she, um, the um, family of Marion Wilson had come to the house to be with us, and when his mother got there, um, all she had was sweatpants and, you know, kind of a sweatsuit. And... She was really embarrassed because part of um, the process of um, death watch is there's a clemency hearing with the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, and the family members can go and beg for their loved one's life to the parole board. And then in the afternoon, the victim's families are, are able to come and tell their side. So, you know, a lot of the family members go and, and speak to the parole board and, again, beg for their loved one's life. And um, Marion's mother was, she was so embarrassed. She's like, I didn't have anything. I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed to wear this old sweatsuit, but it's all I had. So I took her out and we went shopping and got her a nice outfit that she could feel good about wearing. Cause I thought this is a good use of New Hope House money is making sure she feels good about herself when she begs for her son's life. And we t I took her to get her hair cut 
And then she went and she felt so much better about herself. And then eventually, she, when I showed up at Marion's funeral, she was wearing the same outfit. And I thought, this, this was the, some of the best use of New Hope House money I can think of.